Well, welcome everyone and thank you very much for coming today to this information session on the SARP, which is a small animal radiation research platform that we've, we've just acquired on this campus. Um, and so what is that? It's an image-guided preclinical irradiator. And um, just to point out that this is the first SARP in Australia, so it's really quite monumentous for us. And it's also the first image-guided preclinical irradiator on the eastern seaboard of Australia. So we're really very excited to have this, and it's really going to open up a lot more opportunities um, and collaborations for us on this campus. So I'm looking forward to exciting times with this instrument. And you're, you're here to learn about it, but before we, um, before we do that, I'd really just like to start with some acknowledgements because for those of you who don't know, this has been quite a long and arduous task to actually get this far. So first of all, it all started with a, a 2016 Cancer Institute New South Wales grant um, that I put together and I've listed here the co-CIs on this grant. So they were Zdenko Kunsik from CPC, Tom Ede from the Department of Radiation Oncology, Nick Pavlakis and Helen Wheeler from Medical Oncology, Alexander Engel from the Department of Surgery and Sydney Vital, Emily Colvin from the Bill Walsh Lab, the Colling, Dale Bailey from Nuclear Imaging in the hospital, Will Stevenson from Hematology in the hospital, and Regina Bromley um, from the Department of Medical Phys Physics in the hospital. So all of these people contributed their projects, their CVs to this grant, and without them, it certainly would not have been successful. So I really need to acknowledge all of those people. We also, a, a prerequisite for this grant application was to have co-funding, and this was really initiated by Michael Back from the Department of um, Radiation Oncology. Um, and without his go, without his say so, we really weren't able to apply. We wouldn't have been able to apply for this, and we would have had to go for just the radiation cabinet. Um, but ultimately, we had co-funding from Northern Sydney Local Health District and also from the DVCR at the University um, of Sydney. So uh, all of those people and uh, places are acknowledged for their contribution to, towards this piece of equipment, which is, um, has a list price of over $1.5 million um, Australian. So next, um, just getting the money or, you know, getting the promise of the money was, I guess, the easy part. We had a lot of um, other work that needed to be done and the procure procurement process was led by Lewis uh, Nguyen, who is here today as well. And he really guided us through the tender process and, um, and did some amazing deals for us, which is why we have what we have today. Uh, but I was also very ably assisted uh, in working out what we needed and what we should be getting and what we didn't need by Regina Bromley um, from the Department of Physics here and also Nana Sun who's in the audience from the preclinical imaging facility at University of Sydney. Um, in terms of, of trying to navigate the, the funding situation or, or the finance situation in the middle of a review on this campus, I had amazing support from Jonathan Morris and Neil Asanga from the Colling, and, and Vanessa Sanford from Sydney Vital also came in at the last minute and helped. And without all of their help, um, we really wouldn't have gotten through the procurement process. I'd also very much like to acknowledge Trent Bio, so Trent Warburton and um, Amaret Peterson, who were incredibly patient and worked with us because our quote expired in March and we didn't actually say we'd get it until July or it might have even been August. So. Um, they were incredibly patient. And finally, it's not enough to have a piece of equipment, um, especially something as whiz-bang as, as that. We really need to have a resident expert and a manager for the equipment. So my next step was trying to find funding to actually get a manager for the equipment. And 
um, I was able to get this from Sydney Vital and the Sydney Neuro-Oncology Group and they've funded the manager and we now have a very, very capable manager for this piece of equipment, Kelly McKelvey, who some of you should know. Her expertise is in in vivo modelling and um, cell biology. And we're, we're just um, assessing whether what sort of input we need in terms of medical physics and radiation oncology. And here we've got incredible support from the Department of Radiation Oncology to work out what's going to work best so that all the preclinical pre work that we do with this instrument is going to be clinically relevant and, um, and we can trust it in terms of QA and QC. So they're very much on board in working out what we need to be able to move forward this forward with this. So again, I'd like to acknowledge Sydney Vital, Sydney Neuro-Oncology Group and the Department of Radiation Oncology. And, and fine, oh, okay. Um, and it's taken a long time, so I really have to show these photos. This, this is the piece of equipment arriving on our campus. It weighs two and a half tons, and um, I think it took a bit to, um, to get it off the truck and, and installed. And um, there's, there's a few more photos. We did have to go, um, the engineer Dan and I did have to go sort of dumpster diving into one of these to find some keys that had been misplaced. But we found those. Uh, I think the bolts are still missing, is that right? <laughs> the bolts are still missing. And so this is what the, the basic piece of equipment looks like. But we do have an add-on for that. So we actually had this in our facility. So that's a, that's a huge landmark. Um, and that's sort of where um, my role ends. And now I hand over to Kelly, who, as I said, is the SARP manager and she'll introduce um, our speaker for today. Kelly? Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, as Viv has introduced, uh, my role is to be the SARP preclinical irradiator manager uh, on the campus here at Colling, and that's really to facilitate between the researchers and any assistance that we're going to need from extral or from the medical physicists in terms of the radiation treatment planning. And that could be anything from helping with the animal ethics to giving you some guidance about what's clinically relevant for your radiation dosing, um, as well as maybe some of the, the beam arc therapy that, that needs to go ahead there. In the last two weeks, I've really had a, a great time spending uh, a number of hours down in our facility with uh, Wilfred and also with Daniel, who's our engineer, um, both with the installation and also with the training more, more recently. And Wilfred is incredibly personable. He's highly charismatic. He has a wonderful French accent, which you'll get to experience in a few minutes. Um, so Wilfred comes to us. He's done a Master of Science and a, a Master of Business Administration in France originally. He's come all the way across the Pacific Ocean with Daniel from Georgia, Atlanta, leaving behind his wife and three children, probably quite happily. Um, before he went into to science, he was working as an assistant director in one of the national parks over in France. This has a 300 hectare national park, as well as a very large lake in the middle of it. So that's quite a step uh, into science then when you think about it from that. So in 2003, he left France and joined the United States where he's worked all the way up from a lab helper through to a research lead specialist, the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of Maryland, where he spent 12 years working in adaptive immune responses. And this was really working with some really interesting animal models using Xenopus, which is a type of frog, if you're not familiar, and also the nurse shark. It's a big step from our mice and rats that we now have in our, in our SARP uh, preclinical irradiator. He's also spent five years uh, assisting NASA's Space Radiation Laboratory to try and develop and assess the radio protectors against the cosmic radiation and also looking into DNA repair, training a number of NASA students in both the cell culture and also some of the irradiation techniques. So he has really a, a wide range of, of technical expertise, all the way from using a, a microbeam electron gun, which sounds very impressive to me, uh, a cabinet x-ray, which is similar to what our SARP is now, uh, all the way through to what the clinical linear uh, accelerators are. Uh, so the SARP really sits between a, a traditional cabinet x-ray machine and the linear accelerator that we have um, over in our hospital next door. So 
one year ago, or just under one year ago now, uh, Wilfred joined Extral uh, as one of the experts and the application specialists for this piece of equipment, as well as a, a number of other of Extral's uh, instruments. And it's really the, the sort of two years um, that he's worked hands-on with the SARP to, to really give us as much information, as much insight from his own personal experience as he could. Um, we've taken a number of extra notes, uh, which we've added onto the, the training manual. And it's all those little bits of insight that we really couldn't gain uh, from a, a manual per se. And really enjoyed being able to spend that time with Wilfred um, and also having Daniel over here giving us all of that incredible, incredible um, expertise that they have. I mean, as Viva said, that by having this piece of equipment now in the Colling Institute, we have a, a very distinct advantage in terms of our cancer radiation uh, oncology research here in Australia. Um, and also this brings, uh, especially for the patients, because of course, uh, while we're preclinical researchers, it's always the patients at the end of the day that we're really trying to help. This brings our research uh, much, much closer to the, to the clinical scenario and uh, very fortunate that we have a, a piece of equipment that's going to allow us to do that. So, so thank you, and I'd like to welcome Wilfred down to the stage, please. Uh, if you give him a round of applause. Thank you. Never mind. Is it working? All right, all right. Yes, I did. Go. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. I didn't remember having uh, such an impressive uh, bio, but it's great. Uh, I want to start to say, but uh, if you don't understand me, it's totally normal. Okay, my accent is thick, I understand. Um, welcome to the SARP Lounge event. My name is Wilfried Getz. I'm the application specialist with Extra. Formerly, like Kelly said, I work at UMB, University of Maryland, Baltimore, for 12 years as a research lead specialist. And I was a SARP uh, expert user, if we can say so. SARP stands for Small Animal Radiation Research Platform. We were using this instrument in a CRO fashion, preclinical contract research organization. Uh, right. I'm going to be a little slow with this. So why are we here today? So I, I don't really know. Uh, we should stop right here and go to the pub maybe. Um, obviously you already acquired system because you understood the need for more accurate instrument. Cabinet X-ray are underperforming and are lacking accuracy. You've seen the need and the demand for translational modeling, quality over quantity, and being confident of your beam delivery. We can do better than regular cabinet X-ray. If you can't see it, you can't target it. The goal of a radiation oncologist is to deliver a dose of radiation to a specific area in the most conformal way. But basically, you want to be confident of where you are delivering, minimizing tissue toxicity as much as possible. Currently, clinical trials are failing. And why is this? Uh, statistics are showing that there is a lack of translational data that has been developed in the preclinic. Maybe this is due to underperforming equipment, which aren't keeping pace with clinical practice. We cannot solve our problem with the same thinking we used when we created them. Also, we cannot keep generating data that aren't translatable to clinical practice. For example, this is used or used to be cutting edge in a clinic, an old Van de Graaff AP treatment with shielding. No imaging, just a kind of point and shoot method, similar to what we have in a regular cabinet x-ray. This one is the first patient being treated at Stanford for a retinoblastoma with a generation one linear accelerator. Same thing, no imaging, just a point and shoot. Another example of an archaic way of treating an epithelioma with the patient holding its own shielding during treatment. Uh, my point here is we don't treat our patient like this anymore. Clinical practice has made significant improvement. Cone beam CT guided linear accelerator, complex and precise treatment planning system like the Varian Clips, 
And now we're getting to the MR-guided radiotherapy for even increasing targeting accuracy. My words came out fine. They were processed incorrectly by your brain. Um, it seems that the data we are developing in the preclinic isn't being translated because the clinical practice is so far ahead. All right. uh, I'm missing something here. Let's see, there we go. I think we've done a very good job with the animal model as we have immunocompromised mice like nuts kid, all these different type of knocks out, knockouts uh, that can have human disease, different type of cancer, which is great, but our radiation modeling is still poor. So, uh, so far we have only half of the translational secret figured out. Uh, you probably recognize those. Uh, this is still standard practice using a jig and a lead shield with cutout, like the orthotopic glioblastoma example on the right. The source most likely is a regular cabinet X-ray again, irradiating the tumor from the top down. Obviously, this is not how we would treat human patients nowadays. Okay. If you are currently using cabinet X-ray single plane fixed source in a small animal cancer model, then it's a dinosaur. Cell culture is fine, but animal model needs to be treated differently. Although, I also want to point out that this doesn't mean that what we've done until now was not good, was not good research. Uh, it's probably time to level up to clinical practice, though. In order to reproduce the clinical radiotherapy process, we have designed the SARP as translational tool. Hence, its capabilities must mimic the clinical practice workflow and protocols. These are four common steps in clinical radiation therapy that we reproduce with SARP. The cone beam CT imager, a capacity to fuse with other image modality like MRI, a TPS treatment planning system that can allow you to verify and deliver non complainer arc beams like in the clinic. The answer to failure in translational is the lack of targeting. So what the SARP brings is the CT modality, as well as three-dimensional optical system named Muriglo. Now let's take a look uh, on the inside of the SARP. It's fully shielded. It's going to any lab space. It has a 360-degree rotating gantry. It is currently equipped with an octovoltage 225 kV X-ray tube. It has adjustable filtration, aluminum for imaging and copper attenuation for beam hardening. A 20 by 25 centimeter high resolution CT panel detector, which allows you to image multiple mice or a rat. It has a portal camera for fluoroscopic live imaging, which is used to check alignment and do beam's eye view for quick, easy image. But you can also serve, um, that could also serve in the near future for portal dosimetry QA. The robotic stage moves in the X, Y, Z, and theta direction. The SARP is on wheels and fits standard doorways, although we have to take the doors this week. Uh, <laughs> so no need for knocking down walls and rebuild the facility around it. But you get my point. Just a technical defect. I'm not done. Huh? <laughs> um, here are some uh, of the different beam arrangement you can achieve. Non-complainer, APPA or parallel pose, continuous arc, conical arc, static beam, and a TPS treatment planning system, which allows you to do forward planning. There you go, a little video. What do I mean by non complainer beam using a 360 degrees rotating gantry and rotary stage? Well, this video demonstrates exactly what SARP can do. You can deliver a beam of radiation from basically any angle. Acquiring a CT takes only 67 seconds, Re reconstruction being made at the same time, so that as soon as your CT is ending, it is already loaded in your TPS.
The system is medical quality. Xral is both life science and medical device company. So we use the same components for both type of equipment, which assures reliability. The system is very accurate and allows for reproducible results. It's an open platform, meaning when we develop a new technology for it, they can always be adapted, adapted easily to the system that you already have. I have another video here. In this video, uh, you will show what the SARP looks like. You'll notice that leaded glass window in the front, allowing you to monitor your subject during treatment. Two access doors on the side and one on the back for routing anesthesia lines, gas scavenging tubing, cable, etc. It rolls through your standard doorway, but you don't have the standard doorway here. Uh, <laughs> the front openings are slim and convenient sliding bunker doors, so they don't take room in the space. There is also a webcam inside which allows you to monitor your subject from the control station if you don't want to go and look through the window. The TPS, uh, Treatment Planning System, is composed of seven easy steps. CT imaging, image registration, segmentation and contouring, dose planning, dose evaluation or verification, treatment delivery and reporting. Another video. We acquire a CT through a pancake geometry, which means the detector and the X-ray tube are static and the animal moves in the theta circular direction during exposure. Uh, we found that we get spectral, better spectral resolution with this setup compared to a tubular geometry. Here is a picture of three mice laying down on a bed prior cone beam CT acquisition. As I mentioned it earlier, a CT acquisition takes only 67 seconds and its volume reconstruction is being done real time. So what do you obtain after it's done? This, not this, this one. <laughs> the reconstruction is loaded automatically into your TPS, showing four different views, actual sagittal coronal and the three planes together. You can either go through the slice individually by scrolling with the mouse wheel or sliding the slicer above each view. You can adjust your window and level in order to change intensity and contrast. Then you can go to step number two, which is registration. In this step, you'll have the possibility to co-register another CT, MRI, or basically any image, any image modality or any volume with a DICOM format. You can also skip this step and go directly to the segmentation module. Uh, this is a really easy step where the TPS does everything for you. It will identify five different densities from the CT gray level, bone, tissue, fat, lung, and hair. The TPS will take in account those volumes with different density during beam calculation. You could also transform everything in tissue if you wanted to. Uh, you can save your plan at any point of your experiment and come back to it later or load this plan for an ulterior occasion, a different mouse at one week, two weeks, three weeks from now. This is a contouring step. You can contour region of interest, but also region that you'd like to spare, which is very important. And this will be used during the verification step when you generate a DVH or dose volume histogram. Here we've contoured a lung using the automated level tracing tool, or you could also contour manually with the paint effect tool. When you're done with the contour, you click next and place your ISO center. A NASA center is a point of target for beam, usually the center of mass of your tumor or region of interest. You can add beams to this specific ISO center or to several ISO centers. If needed, then compute those and go to the next step, which is verification before treatment. In this view, you can see all beam entry, ISO doses, 3D dose volume, and a great DVH for target, since here, in this example, we have nearly the full dose, 100% of the dose, being delivered to 100% of your volume. At this point, if you're okay, which I would be with this plan, you could choose to save it and execute it. Lastly, you have the possibility to finish this procedure by generating a report. 
So I told you a lot about uh, the system itself. Now I would like to also show you some studies that were done using the SARP. We have uh, probably around 120 uh, papers that have been published with the SARP. I selected only a few of them because I slacked a little bit in reading those publications lately, uh, being very busy uh, on the road. Uh, this is a good study that shows uh, translatability in reproducing apocampal, hippocampal sparing radiation technique in mice. The study came out of Albert Einstein. It was publish published in Nature. Uh, the result may be an RTOG0933 trial where mice were getting all brain irradiation as well as giving hippocampal sparing irradiation, which is easily feasible with SARP, but not so easy with cabinet X-ray. If you don't avoid hippocampus, you can get neurocognitive dysfunction, a decrease in neurogenesis and cell proliferation. You also increase overall animal death. This study is of uh, Beaumont, uh, an early adopter of SARP. What they did was basically compare what we've been talking about this entire time, cabinet X-ray versus SARP. They had the standard model with intracranial glioblastoma using a lead jig. This is how you irradiate mice in a cabinet. You put them under azofloran or a mix of ketamine and zalazine. You nuke them from top down. It's really hard to avoid the optics or to spare the salivary gland, the trachea, the esophagus. But if you target the brain with a SARP and you plan parallel opposed beam in a vertex field, you can easily spare all those organs. Therefore, you can give them a more clinically relevant dose as the subject will survive and won't die halfway through treatment. With a cabinet X-ray, you might achieve 30 gray, when with a SARP, you'll go up to 60 gray. Beaumont had a MR and a PET system as well, so they were able to fuse and co-register this volume with the CT for even more accurate targeting. The findings are pretty cool. As you see, the control animal needed to be sacrificed really fast after only 21 days. With the single beam, they were able to get two gray per day for five consecutive days with two day break, but they had to be sacrificed after 27 days. Although with the SARP, the tumor delay was much greater. The dose was clinically irrelevant and the survival was excellent compared to control and single beam model. Another big concern or in a clinic or issue in the clinic when offering radiotherapy is to minimize normal tissue toxicity, especially in head and neck patients. Because of this concern, there are a lot of studies going on in the preclinic right now regarding radio protectors and radio mitigators. What you can do with the SARP is trying to replicate clinical problems, find a resolution, and move back into clinical practice. For instance, this study on the left from Bowman, where they were looking at radiation toxicity to the bladder. Radiation toxicity to the bladder is inevitable within irradiating, when irradiating females that have cervical cancer. In order to mimic this, they use a rat model sitting vertical, so its abdomen will drop, separate, and allow for increased targeting accuracy. Then they investigated radio protectors to overcome normal tissue toxicity, looking at incontinence, bleeding, inflammation, and so on. They found that tacrolimus used as a radio protector works for this model and was then adopted in clinic. On the right, a study came out of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which looked at targeting a very small area of the intestinal tract, like a five millimeter area. They surgically implanted a radiopaque marker and investigated curcumin as a radio protector. This group found that indeed the area of the intestinal tract which were irradiated and treated with curcumin were showing increased radio protection. Now curcumin can be, usually, or can be used clinically as radio protector as well. There is also a lot of buzz in, uh, in the past few years regarding immunotherapy and cancer. And uh, we look at four different papers from four labs, three separate models with different immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, and what we found is that if we add up all the animal survival amongst all the papers, then you find that in combination, targeting radiation with SARP plus immune checkpoint increased tremendously survival. 
Uh, this also shows us how reproducible studies can be conducted with SARP. Uh, here it's finally where I introduce a little more my company. Extral is uh, both medical device and life science company. We make orthovoltage cancer treatment system. We have a 100, 200, and 300 kV for non-melanoma skin cancer. We are also launching a new photoelectric therapy uh, unit, which has an 80 kV X-ray tube, and is used mainly for superficial treatment. We have about 700 medical systems worldwide, 70 cabinet irradiators, the single plane which you shouldn't use for small animal cancer model anymore. And we have around 61 SARP and 4 Xenex worldwide. Extra is all about customer support, and this is probably what sets us aside from other radiation-based companies. We employ experienced researchers that support our customers the best way possible by truly understanding their needs. We develop almost all our product in-house, but also we benefit of help by collaborating with prestigious groups such as Johns Hopkins, where the SARP was first developed at. We use obviously phone, emails, computer, remote access software like TeamViewer, or on-site troubleshooting. TrendBio, our partner in Australia, will also partake in supporting your needs. Yes? All right. <laughs> All our systems are commissioned in-house. Actually, I take care personally of the commissioning. The SAP is used at many levels, university, research, hospital, big pharma, and contract research organization. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the additional accessories we have available for the system. We have many different animal beds, one to three mouse bed, rat or mouse vertical bed, a universal bed that can go easily into an MR and goes back onto the SAP, keeping the animal positioned for cleaner fusion. Um, there we have heated bed as well. Um, so you can maintain the animal body temperature while under anesthesia. Uh, they can have integrated isofluorine mask, vertical option are also available. Lastly, uh, we are going to talk about Muriglo. You guys have Muriglo here, uh, which is very exciting. And also the fact that you are the first startup in Australia, and therefore you open a full new continent to us. I'm pretty sure uh, most people here are aware of uh, what bioluminance is, but to simply describe it, I could say that you start by transfecting your cell with luciferase protein. This is a conserved gene. So what it means is that the cell will proliferate and multiply with that gene attached to it. You implant the cell or the tumor into the mouse, and then before you do imaging, you inject your subject with luciferin, which will bind to those sites. Then you expose your sample and collect images under a specific wavelength set. I hope I'm not boring you to death right now. Uh, CBCT does not effectively d uh, differentiate between soft tissue and tumors. BLI has become a standard in tumor imaging for preclinical model. It is cheaper than PET and allows for quantitative analysis of tumor growth. Exist existing system generate 2D uh, bioluminescence imaging. This does not provide depth of, of the tumor. In irradiation studies, this can mean irradiation or radiation is being delivered off target if the tumor is deep within the tissue, like we have right there. As you can see here, the 2D BLI can be misleading, especially if you want to target your region of interest by just checking one plane, then you'll be missing the target depth accuracy. If you have two targets sitting close to each other, then it could be perceived as only one big tumor, when they are in fact two different regions. So we developed Muriglo. It is a three-dimensional three optical system with a rotating mirror assembly that captures light intensity from all the way around the animal. It has a high-resolution cool CCD camera, charge coupled device camera, that records precisely the emitted light. It has reconstruction protocols and algorithms which convert the light intensity data into a center of mass that becomes your isocenter. The system may soon accept a fluorescent camera, and this is currently in development. 
This slide is just showing you the mirror assembly used to capture light from all angles. Here we have an, another little video. Um, okay. This is an old video of the mirror glow. The present hardware is a little different, but the principle remains the same. What hasn't changed is the mirror assembly and how the emitted light is captured within the animal. Uh, the beauty of mirror glow is that it can function as a standalone or can be used integrated. Mounted on an articulated arm which can easily dock inside the SARP. The same bed will be used for both BLI and CT acquisition. So the animal position won't change, which is usually quite the challenge when you're trying to fuse two different image modalities together. Uh, this is a GIF image showing the docking process into the SARP. It looks like it was done here, actually. Actually. Oh, yeah, the only thing, we have a, a different uh, front now. Okay. Uh, the bed, like I said, are heated as well in the mirror glow. There are fiducial markers on top and the bottom for geometric calibration purpose of both the BLI and the CT acquisition. The workflow is basically you acquire a BLI, you calibrate, acquire a CT, fuse, mesh, and data mapping, then creation of a center of mass, and you can irradiate. You're going to be able to identify, uh, to identify a tumor that you may have not been able to see with just a CT alone. Remember earlier I showed you an image of a 2D system having trouble dissociating two tumors close to each other? Well, uh, Muriglo can identify different tumors that are just three millimeters apart. Now what's next with uh, Muriglo? Well, uh, we are looking at new algorithms to enable tumor volume quantification by optical intensity as well as integrating a fluorescent tomography module. So now we are back uh, to where we started, or are we? We cannot solve our problem with the same thinking we used when we created them. Although after this presentation, I presume we can all agree that we have better idea of what we should use as far as instrument in cancer research study. If we want to produce clinically relevant data, we need to integrate new technology in our experiment especially if we are seeking a translation of those data into the clinic. Now you see it, now you can target it. What we are looking as a company is uh, trying to do better by taking user feedback and integrating new tools and ideas customer would like to see appear in our system. The main focus we are currently working on is first bettering our imaging modality as it only will increase targeting accuracy. And second, we always look to improve the experimental workflow so then we could irradiate more animals per day. This is it. Um, uh, <laughs> presentation is done. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Vive Orwell for the acquisition, or Viva I should say. Uh, for the acquisition of uh, our instrument, as well for the warm welcome uh, in the institution. Many thanks to TrendBio, our distributor, for their tremendous help and support. A huge thank you to Kelly McKelvey for organizing and planning everything for us. That's pretty much. Thank you for listening.